going to change to the build episode now. Our BBC One has Panorama uncovered the whole truth. Hello, I'm Jeremy Vine and this is Panorama. We had a picture and now we have a name, Peter. And I got to say sorry too, you know, I should have been there for him. I should have been. I was, but I wasn't allowed to be there. Social workers have been sacked, ministers have acted and reports have been written. But have we heard the whole story about Baby P? Had that been disclosed, there is a very good chance, in my judgment, that that little boy would now still be alive. It's not quite time to draw the curtain on the baby P story, which threw child protection so dramatically back into the spotlight. Later this month, his mother, her boyfriend and their lodger will be sentenced for their part in making his short life so painful and so tragic. Tonight, we reveal more details from our own investigation, which sheds new light on just how much information social workers had about the family and raises new questions about why they couldn't save little Peter. Here in his own home, baby Peter should have been safe. His is a story of neglect, abuse, missed opportunities, then national outrage. His ribs were cracked, his back broken, 50 injuries scarring a tiny body. His mother didn't protect him, she lied and lied to hide the boyfriend who abused her son. Social workers, doctors and police didn't manage to protect him either, even though they knew he was at risk. There isn't the evidence for anyone to lose their job. If there was, that would have happened. There was no sorry. Haringey Council said it did all it could. But this tragedy ignited the anger and distress of strangers. Many professionals failed Baby P, but the spotlight fell on the usual suspects, the social workers. This is a story about a social services department that gets £100 million pounds a year and can't look after children. Yeah. That's what this is about. In Haringey, within weeks, there were sackings, resignations, and the word sorry. We are truly sorry that we did not do no more to protect him. And Peter's life of abuse put child protection across the country under scrutiny. It is our first duty in government and as a society to do all we can to keep our children safe. Later this month, the people responsible for Peter's death will be sentenced. For legal reasons, we still can't see the faces of his mother or her boyfriend. He was also found guilty last week of raping a little girl. Their lodger, Jason Owen, will also be sentenced over Peter's death. That might have been the closing chapter in the story of Baby P. But tonight, Panorama can reveal the story that hasn't been told. It centers on the boyfriend. Haringey Council has maintained he was hidden, making it impossible to assess the dangers Baby P faced. But was he really invisible? Peter was first taken to hospital in December 2006. He had a bump on his head and bruising across his nose. His mum claimed only she and his grandma looked after him. Both were arrested and he was placed on the at-risk register. But how hard was this fractured family trying to hide the boyfriend? I've been to meet Peter's grandma. This is the first time she's spoken on television. She says social workers asked her about a man her daughter described as just a friend. She told them what she could, with her daughter listening upstairs. But she did tell me not to mention the boyfriend. What I did say was he's doing more often than me. Matter of fact, I wouldn't be surprised if he had moved in. 
because I wasn't 100% sure. Because that time, all this stuff wasn't in there at that time. You understand? It's only after this that he moved in properly. Last November, Haringey told us they had no record of this conversation. As Panorama revealed then, almost immediately there were splits over the case. A senior social worker wanted Peter taken into foster care, but she was overruled. So he returned to his mother. The boyfriend was probably staying overnight by then. She's certainly telling chatroom friends about him. No longer with my ex-husband. I've now met someone lovely. Those who know the boyfriend say he's a loner with learning difficulties. He struggles with depression and has a fascination with knives and the Nazis. The grandma was worried and increasingly shut out of the family. Everything he talked about was violence. That's all he ever talked about in my company was violence. My grandson started getting frightened of the boyfriend and he was scared of the boyfriend. When the boyfriend come in the door and the boy would be over there he'd, and I'd be here, he comes crawling over to me, scream for me to pick him up and hide behind me. But is it just that early mention of the boyfriend that was missed? Panorama has discovered information that Haringey didn't reveal about Baby P's case and the missed opportunities to save him. These are the now disused offices where the social workers who were protecting Peter were based. Panorama has discovered that the social workers here were piloting a new way of working with the parents of at-risk children. It's called solution-focused brief therapy. And the idea is that rather than dwelling on a family's problems, you... These are the now disused offices where the social workers who were protecting Peter were based. Panorama has discovered that the social workers here were piloting a new way of working with the parents of at-risk children. It's called solution-focused brief therapy. And the idea is that rather than dwelling on a family's problems, you ask the parents what they would like their life to be like in the future. Then together, you decide how to achieve that. This was in addition to the usual checks. But the risk of focusing on a parent's future is you may miss what's happening to their child now. I've been to Sweden to meet the international expert who took this approach and adapted it for child protection. Andrew Tunnell stresses the dangers to a child must be constantly in your mind. Solution focus gives you a lot of good skills, it gives you ways of engaging with families, but you must bring to the table very clearly what the problem is, and you must talk very clearly with the family about the past, about the harm to the child, the neglect, the maltreatment. And if you try and use solution focused without doing that, if you try and use it as a therapy, a therapist would use it in the therapy room, it, it can very quickly become dangerous, particularly in high-risk cases. His signs of safety approach puts the child's protection first. In Haringey, he sees little evidence that was happening. Social workers there have told us they did a two-day course in solution-focused therapy. They say not much time was spent on assessing risk. Some called it useless. It didn't keep baby P safe either. Over eight months, he was taken to hospital three times with suspicious injuries. Towards the end, he was losing weight, had scabs on his ears, fingers and head. But his mum seemed to be working well with social workers. How could they spot the man in the shadows, the hidden boyfriend? It's not like the mother sat down and told them about him. Is it? A child isn't constantly being observed. There isn't a video running in that, that home. There wasn't a way of knowing that there's a man hiding in the, in the wardrobe. But amazingly, there is a video. Panorama has learnt his mother recorded an hour-long interview with a senior social work manager made not at home, but in the Haringey office. Crucially, she talks at length about the man we now know beat her son and raped a small girl. 
we're told she describes him helping make the garden nice for Peter. She says her ex-husband claimed they were having an affair, and her reaction was, I wish. We also understand she talks about preparing him a steak dinner for Valentine's night, and says he makes her feel good. We're told she mentions his first name twice, and describes him as six foot four, blonde, and every girl's dream. The manager, Sue Gilmore, was making the video for a diploma in solution-focused therapy. Funded by Haringey Council, this was March 2007, four months before baby P died. Mrs. Gilmore says she put a detailed note of the interview on Peter's electronic case file, but it didn't mention it was videoed. There should have been checks on this friend. The police also needed to know. The abuse investigation into what happened to Peter in December was drifting. Former detective John Shatford wasn't involved in Peter's case, but until 2007, he headed the homicide team covering Haringey. They're investigating injuries that this boy sustained. So they are going to be thinking, well, who else could have done that? And the mention of a man who's close to this woman would have meant that they would have wanted to speak to that man, if not to eliminate him from it, even as a witness to say, well, how does she treat her children? What do you know about it? But the police aren't told about the interview or the video. This friend wasn't questioned, and an important opportunity to save baby P is missed. Two weeks later, Peter is taken to hospital for a second time. He has a large swelling on his head. As we revealed last autumn, the police investigating the original abuse allegations aren't told. Peter's third visit to hospital was in June. Taken there by his social worker, he had worrying bruises. This time, the police are told. From the office here, a number of key decisions were made after that hospital visit. We've seen police documents that reveal officers told Mrs. Gilmore they wanted baby P removed from home. They appear increasingly baffled when that doesn't happen. According to our information, a senior officer wrote in the police log, the situation cannot continue. In response to the mother's claims that baby P fights with other children, he comments, he's 15 months old, this is wrong, and continues, I'm at a loss as to why our position is at variance to that held by social services. Our concerns for baby P are valid. As we revealed last autumn, there was a frank exchange of views between a senior police officer and a manager. That was Mrs. Gilmore. It's detailed in an internal police document written after Peter's death. It concludes social services may have been too parent focused, allowing a rule of optimism. When you start to get close to a parent and you see the good parts of that parent, you see the, the parts of the parent trying to be a good um, parent, then you start to overstate that and understate their weaknesses. Um, and it is a well-known vulnerability. Mrs. Gilmore was respected by her colleagues and left Haringey early last year of her own accord. She says she raised the question of removing Peter and requested a legal planning meeting, but major decisions were made by multi-agency She says she raised the question of removing Peter and requested a legal planning meeting, but major decisions were made by multi-agency conferences, not by her. And the list of professionals who failed Baby P is long. The police abuse investigation went nowhere. Haringey sent the mother to parenting classes when she told the staff she was pregnant a month before Peter died. No one seems to have asked about the father or told social workers. And at the beginning of August, a paediatrician, Dr. Seba Alzayat, misses the last chance to save him. She doesn't spot his broken ribs. She may even have missed a broken back. At some point, the following day, he's hit in the mouth so hard, he swallows a tooth. The next morning, here in this room, Peter is found in his cot, dead.
But he could have been saved if someone had spotted the abuser in the house. So how many times was the boyfriend missed? The grandma mentioned him. His Christian name is on the minutes of the first case conference. Peter's father told social workers he thought there was a boyfriend. A childminder sees him when Peter is dropped off. And then there's the video. After Peter's death, his mother and her boyfriend are arrested. A murder investigation starts. After such a tragedy, you'd expect that everyone would now want to find out the whole story. Detectives asked Haringey for all the information they had on the family. The police say even then they were told nothing about the existence of the video. Of course it should have been handed over. It was entirely relevant. And, and in fact, you, you know, I'm, I'm for once in my life almost speechless here. It, it, it seems such a natural course that, would that they would take, not only for the individual who made that video, but of course for Haringey Council. They knew that the research was going on. Why on earth didn't they say, here we are, um, we've got this extra material that, that will be relevant. Again, we should be talking about the, the, this little boy and finding out what happened to him now. Mrs. Gilmore maintains details about the interview were recorded. Haringey says it was unaware of the video until this February and that responsibility for what went to detectives lies with former Director of Children's Services, Sharon Shoesmith, and her deputy, Cecilia Hitchin. Mrs. Shoesmith says she can't comment on the video, but advised by a barrister, everything was disclosed, with only documents with public interest immunity withheld. Cecilia Hitchin has refused to comment. However uncomfortable, the professionals involved need to learn from such a tragedy. That's why a serious case review is held to look at how the child's case was handled. Panorama can reveal the authors of that first report were also told nothing about the pilot scheme, the study, or the video. Professor Eileen Munro has conducted serious case reviews. What happens if a serious case review is told nothing about this? They give a false investigation into what went wrong. They can't possibly have an accurate idea if they've not told some of the most basic information. Can we draw any conclusions from this about the system within Haringey and how it was working? Well, it seems to have been not communicating well within itself uh, because um, parts of it didn't know what other parts were doing. Haringey Council now says solution-focused therapy was not appropriate in this case. In future, new approaches like this will be considered by an ethics committee. Mrs. Gilmore has told us she didn't complete the course and didn't meet Peter. Her coursework was destroyed before he died, as it contained confidential information. She says she told detectives about the interview with the mother in January 2008. The police say they weren't told about the video itself or that it mentioned the boyfriend, so it wasn't part of the evidence in the murder trial. All contact with the family should be noted on a child's electronic file. Mrs. Gilmore's note about the interview was on it, but Panorama can reveal it wasn't on the file printout given to police. Haringey admits serious failings. It says improved management will reduce the risk of further failures to capture and disclose information, and they've made fundamental changes to child protection, but questions remain. If people were manipulating information, or if they were denying information going to the independent scrutineers, that would be totally unprofessional, totally wrong, and um, I would want to see action immediately locally, and I'd demand action myself. And are serious feelings widespread around the country? The Secretary of State insists Haringey is one of just a few bad apples in the child protection barrel. Well, we um, saw after the Baby P um, trial finished, the detail of the serious case review. I was sufficiently concerned at that point to send in the inspectors. They did a very thorough report, and they came back with a report which was devastating about, uh, uh, about leadership, about management, about practice. And um, that's why I had to act. 
The fact is that um, in over 100 areas of the country, we have uh, reports from Ofsted which have been good or outstanding. So, according to the minister, most parts of the country are good at protecting our children. But can he trust the judgments made by Ofsted, the inspectors who monitor child protection? Currently, just eight authorities, including Haringey, are failing. But each week, one or two children, like Peter, die at the hands of a parent or carer. We've looked at hundreds of serious case reviews into such deaths, and how the inspectors rate an authority doesn't seem to say much about how a child is protected. The evidence is that children die uh, as often in failing authorities as in really good authorities. Um, so whatever's going on that affects a child's risk of being killed is not at the moment being measured as in really good authorities. Um, so whatever's going on that affects a child's risk of being killed is not at the moment being measured very effectively. And Ofsted clearly didn't pick up on what was happening on the ground in Haringey. It was rated good at protecting children the year that Peter died. It was a different story when the government sent the inspectors back in after his mother and boyfriend were convicted. This time, Ofsted failed Haringey. And extracts from the inspector's notebooks, which we've obtained under a Freedom of Information request, show why. They say, performance data in children's social care is unreliable and in some important instances, inaccurate. Ofsted will now carry out yearly unannounced visits to local authorities. It will concentrate more on frontline practice. Many social workers tell us they're struggling right now with high caseloads and staff shortages. I think at the front line in social work, we're pretty close to a crisis in the sense that I don't think, when you've got so many professionals saying at the front line, we are worried, we don't feel that what's going on is, is adequate and safe, then I think that's, 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 a, that's a serious concern. I'm on my way to Surrey, a failing authority, but here social workers are so worried they're considering industrial action. They want to remain anonymous. They fear by speaking out, they could lose their jobs. My caseload is in excess of 20. You feel that you're doing an impossible job because you're having to spread yourself across a large number of families. Surrey Council says caseloads are allocated after a detailed risk assessment and vulnerable children are the number one priority. But social workers here are still dealing with more children than the overstretched social worker in Baby P's case. You can regularly see workers crying at work, um, paralysed because of the amount of work they've got to do. If you've got the time to be able to properly evaluate the situation, you can go back and think about that and think, well, actually, I need another check. Somebody else might have to go out for a second opinion. At the moment, they haven't got the time to do that. And that's why there's the dangers, uh, not just in Surrey, but all over the country. Surrey Council says although cases have risen, it's taken on more staff. It says Unison only represents a minority of its employees and that some have found efforts to improve performance difficult to cope with. But we've heard the worries voiced here repeated around the country. We've got an important job to try and do. And when you feel that the whole system is flawed and that sometimes you don't feel that it's fit for purpose and you can't actually do the job that you're meant to be doing, then it's no wonder that children's lives can be put at risk. High caseloads and staff shortages are national problems. Nearly two-thirds of local authorities say they have difficulties recruiting children's social workers. In Haringey, when Peter was on the register, it's claimed there was a rise in children needing protection. Social workers struggled to cope. It's nothing new. What was very misleading about Child P was it gave the media and the public the impression that this was something startlingly different or a departure from the norm. But actually, you know, the rate of children who have been killed in this way hasn't changed. And the main reason it hasn't changed over the last 30 years 
is that we haven't addressed the fundamental causes. Peter lived just streets away from the place where another child was tortured nine years ago. Victoria Climbier's death in a tiny Haringey flat caused a national outcry. Lord Laming headed a public inquiry that listed many failings. It led to a new child protection system. The government policy called Every Child Matters promised vulnerable children would be safer. There were new departments, new IT systems, but still too few staff with too many cases. None of it helped Peter. I think it's a really interesting question as to why we haven't made faster progress. If I think about the last 18 months in my job since I came to this new department for children, schools and families, the voice to me of teachers about what they wanted for the future of their profession has been loud and clear, from head teachers too, but from social workers, the social worker contribution professionally to the future of their profession and the public debates to me has been very silent. Well, and they've I partly, well, they no, wanted to put their well, viewpoints, and know. we didn't find it difficult to find people who yeah. were desperate to talk. I actually, um, you know, uh, 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 in part, I hold my hands up and say we should have asked social workers to speak up more. But also, I find, and I was in Harringay just last week talking to social workers, there hasn't been a strong enough sense of the profession and their voice, and their demands and their views, and that's something which needs to change. But who would speak out as a social worker? They know they're usually singled out for blame when things go wrong, whatever pressures they face. In Haringey, still reeling from the outcry that followed Victoria Climbier's death, we know staff were terrified by what might follow a second tragedy. If you get it wrong, you need to know that you're going to be supported by your professional organisations, by your employers, and not hung out to dry. The danger that professionals discern of not being properly supported they'll start making these decisions based on what's right for them or the organisation when they should be making the decisions in terms of what's right for the child. Last week, four more Haringey staff were sacked. Maria Ward, Peter's social worker. Her immediate boss, Jilly Christou. Clive Priest, the service manager. And Cecilia Hitchin, deputy director of children's services. But even now, have we heard the whole story? Immediately after Peter's death, his electronic file was locked. It's a legal requirement to prevent what is now evidence in a police investigation being tampered with. Panorama has discovered that Peter's file was entered twice after it was locked. Haringey says an expert has checked and no changes were made. But police sources have told us it hasn't been forensically examined by an independent expert. examined by an independent expert. And what have we learnt from Peter's death? Lord Laming called in again, says the system protecting children nationally is the right one. A social work task force is examining frontline pressures. Yet again, the promise is things will get better. Will it bring back the little boy who died in Harrogate? No, I can't do that. But can we try to make sure that we don't repeat that kind of tragedy in the future? Yes, we can. Each time a child like Peter dies, we hear the words, never again. But how much confidence can we have that the same mistakes won't be made in the future? If you ask me the question, is there any reason at the moment to think that the rate of child deaths is going to be any less than 30 years' time than it was 30 years ago? The answer is no. Alison Holtz reporting. Later this week, the government will announce details of how it intends to improve child protection and the summary of a new serious case review into the death of Peter is likely to be published in the summer. Next week, banking, dirty money and the missing billions. What English cricket wishes it knew about Alan Stanford before it took his cash. If you or someone you know is affected by the issues raised in tonight's programme and would like details of information and support, go to bbc.co.uk slash panorama. If you don't have access to the internet, call the BBC Action Line in confidence on 0800 077 077. Lines are open 24 hours a day. Landline calls are free, but mobile operators will charge.